1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> and we're going to do a, a pop quiz, an open book pop quiz to begin with. Forget my eyeballs. Ah. <laughs> but one's dropped out already. <laughs> the conviction is heavy. <laughs> First Thessalonians. This is a little book. It has uh, five chapters. It has 89 verses, 1,857 words. And if you take two chapters a day, you can finish the book in two and a half days. Now, really, realistically, this book you can finish in one reading. It's, and it lends itself to it. There's short chapters, and anybody can read 2,000 words in a day. Um, okay, so you're in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Leaf through that book in your Bible and notice the things you've marked. Here's the pop quiz part. Exactly. Let's find out if God's talked to you in this book. He should have pointed some things out to you in your own reading of this book that you remember. You should have every book of the Bible. You should... Note something. God should be speaking to you. When, he, when you read that book, that's God talking. And he should say something. And you should highlight something. You should make a note and underline a circle or something that says, ah, that was me. I noticed God talk when he said that right there. Anybody? All the excuses are endless. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh huh. You should do something. Here's why. You'll want to show it to somebody. You should want to show it to somebody. When God speaks to us, it's not just for us. It always is a multiplication. When He shows something and teaches us something, it's not just for us. Otherwise, we've become selfish. You just give me, I'm a sponge, I want... No, we should be ready to give it out to somebody else. Yeah, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. 1, verse 10, now, okay. understand that my soul, this, all of this looks like a Christmas tree. Uh-huh, good, so good. That's right. And wait for his son from heaven, uh, whom he raised from the dead, and he was to live us from the wrath. Yes. That's huge. Yes, it Absolutely. is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. I have that as a favorite of mine, too. I have chicken breast. Well, yeah, I, I would expect. We all know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So what I do is I have a memo. Well, that works. That's phone, real good. But I do have a few things underlined. Okay. I've got to reread them to interpret my memo. Right. <laughs> because that's how bad it is. Hey. My Bible, school, my Bible school Bible is like that. I go back through it and I say, what was I thinking? I don't understand that at all. <laughs> so what do you got? Oh, I've got a few things, but I'll just say this one. First um, Thessalonians 2, verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel mm. of God only, but also our own soul, because yes. you were dear unto us. Mm -hmm. And what I have notated next to that was, there should be a motivation of love, love for people, love for souls. Mm -hmm. Behind, I mean, it's important to give truth, but even throughout the Bible, you see, let not mercy and truth be safe. See, you have to have the right heart behind the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you Bible readers don't necessarily have to have had it underlined, but like Jan's about to do, you'll remember by just leafing through it, you'll, you'll have read it so many times that something will pop back out at you. Jan, what you got? Read that again, that he might what? That he might, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. He it's not God. establish, it's establish. establish. Yeah. There's a difference. Establish your mm hmm Yep, that's a good one. And that's underlining my memo. I like the memo. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Rather than me just give you a bunch of scholastics on the book, which is what I normally do on Wednesday night, I just do an overview of the books of the Bible. And um, tonight's overview would be 1 Thessalonians. But I hate boring you to death with information that doesn't mean anything to you. And sometimes y'all need to do the preaching, and I need to do the listening. <laughs> so that's the way I opened it. Now I'll go back to the boring part, and y'all can listen to me again. <laughs> The background of this book is this. It's Paul writing with gratitude and affection to this church. He visited them briefly in uh, Romans. You find that in Romans, I believe it's chapter 17. Yeah, Romans 17, verse 1 to 9. And this is probably one of his first, uh, the first and second epistle here is probably one of his first writings to the Gentile churches that he visited on his second missionary journey. The theme of this, both this book and the next one, is the coming of Jesus Christ. And you find about 20 references to that fact. At the end of each chapter, you get an uplifting note that says, cheer up, you're a Christian, good is coming. Now, you don't find that a lot. A lot of times what you find is, hey, I've heard some bad news about you and you better straighten it up. That's what he had to confront with many of his churches, but he didn't with this one. This was a young church and he was encouraged by the report he had gotten with uh, how well they were doing. Uh, let's see, look at chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. If you need an encouragement, there's, there's a bunch of books you can read, but <laughs> Philippians is a good one. But also 1 and 2 Thessalonians, because it puts your focus on something that's out of this world, literally. Chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That tells you something right up front. There's wrath that's coming that you will not experience. So however bad it, it is, and sometimes we feel like it gets pretty bad, that's not the wrath that's to come. It the world, the lost world, is going to experience wrath like nobody's business. And what little bits we taste is nothing compared to that. So we know from the, from the verse right there, we're not going to be around for that tribulation. It's sometimes it's hard to keep that in perspective. Yeah. You know, our air goes <laughs> no. <laughs> we have to watch anything like this. Right. Yeah. I listened to David Peacock. Yeah. Their children cut out, and he said, "I'm probably just not going to mention anything." Yep, in heaven. Yep. Here we are in America. Now, don't get me wrong. If we're doing right, we have tribulation promise. Mm -hmm. Not only do you get to believe, but in some area. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and the great thing will be this: in heaven, it will be clear. Those people that experience the physical persecution were promised the same. So you've experienced the very same persecution, but maybe not with the physical, maybe in the spirit realm. And uh, when we get to heaven, it'll all be apparent that we all had the same opportunities and experienced the th same problems coded in different garb. Look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So this is a good thing. He's saying um, he wants to get the family together again. And he's saying one day we're going to all be present. Now that meant something to Paul. Think about it. As Paul's going across these, uh, these boundaries of cities and countries, He's got to spend a little time with this one, but then he can't stay there. In this book, you find he has a real affection for these people, but he couldn't hang out long. He had to move on. And so it's probably a lot of nostalgia that he experienced because he builds a rapport and, you know, you, you feel like he really loves these people and then he's got to move on. He's got to get going. 
and the the thing that's a, a joy in the future for him is one day they'll all be back together again in the presence of Christ will be the same even the people we don't want to get together with right now that are Christians one day we can get together with them and they'll be just as perfect as we are <laughs> chapter 3 chapter 3 verse 13 this is Jan's verse to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints that is one day you're going to be perfect 100% perfect right now you have the perfect Holy Spirit in you there's nothing wrong with that that one's 100% holy now your soul is halfway there that's what you're perfecting or that's your job that's the control center that controls am I gonna obey the spirit or am I gonna obey the flesh the flesh is no good. One day he's going to remake that one so it will be good. Hallelujah. And yeah, that one that can't come fast enough. Now that verse has one word in it I want to look at. He says that he may establish, not establish. That's an imp those are two words that you'll want to notice in your Bible. That's English, not Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> it, it doesn't come out in the Greek. In the English it does. Establish means something has already been established and now you're refining it look it up in english in your bible every time the word establish is used and every time the word establish is used and you'll see that definition to be true chapter 4 chapter 4 verse 16 for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now he got the right thing right, right there. The, the great thing is not that we're going to a pie in the sky, but that the, we're going to be with the Lord. I mean, that's what's important. We'll be right with him. We've been separated, I mean, physically, we shouldn't be separated spiritually. Sometimes we are there too. We shouldn't be. But one day, that'll all be over with. We'll be 100% with him, uh, both in mind and physical. Look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 23. He says, in the very, uh, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, your flesh is the sinful part of you. Your body is something different. Your body is something God uses. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, you're to yield this body, the members of it, to the service of God and let him use it. So in essence, there's no excuse. We can't just blame everything on the flesh did it, the flesh did it. Well, God wanted to do something with your body too. What'd you let him do? Let's get off that. It's getting too heavy. <laughs> Only those who are living according to the hope that's been given to us as Christians want to be translated into the presence of Jesus Christ physically. You find Christians who are not living like Christians they're not excited about him coming back. You'll notice over the years, that's one message that seems to have disappeared. Yes. Is people don't talk about, hey, when you think he's coming back. You know, that used to be an important message. Mm -hmm. Everybody had their own theory on, he's coming back and, you know, I just feel like it's going to be. Well, that's because they were looking for it. They couldn't wait for it. Yeah. But... The more you look for it, the more excited you get about something future. And it makes all of this trouble and turmoil and junk we got down here start to dim. It's a good thing for a Christian. Now, the outline of the book is, uh, I simply put it as chapter one, is we see the example of their lives, the Thessalonians. And then in chapel, chapter two, chapel, in chapter two, we see the example of their ministry. Uh, how they've ministered to others. In chapter 5, we see um, 
the whole assembly as an example of Christian faith. Now, churches begin to take on a prasanna. Um, you find churches specialize in different things, and that's fine. God calls them to that. Here, this church, he's saying, you're a good example of faith. That would be good to be known as. A good example of, and he uses the definite article, the faith. And that's what every Christian individually should be an example of. But because there was enough individuals being an example of it, the whole assembly, the church, was known as that's an example of what a Christian ought to be. That would be a good thing to know. In chapter 1, chapter 1, we'll see the character of these believers. Chapter 1, in verse 5, they're converted to the gospel and the Holy Ghost. You can't do Christian things as an unsaved person and it be successful. Matter of fact, as a Christian, you can't let the flesh do Christian things and be successful. Jesus Christ has to do it through you. The power of the Holy Ghost has to shine through, not this flesh. You know, your determination and your willpower, that's not worth anything to God. His power coming through you is worth something. Uh, no doctrines of men or doctrines of uh, denominations is important. Now, those do have their importance, but those are not to be prominent. What's to be prominent is the power of God. That's sadly missing in our day and age. Um, and let's see, in verse 6, when you understand that salvation is in the finished work of Christ, then it's not a part of this unfinished believer's job <laughs> to complete something. Think about it. If Christ couldn't complete it, how do you think I'm going to? Okay, so take some stress off of yourself. It's not your willpower that's going to complete what needs to be done. It's your submission to him. It's a relinquishing of rights that empowers him to do something through us. And that's a hard one to get, and it's a hard one to grasp. And as soon as you do, ten minutes later, you forget it. <laughs> They became followers of the Lord in verse 6. We should all be followers of the Lord, and that's not a one time and you're done. That's a daily, hourly, moment by moment thing. Um, before you know it, you're following self, not him. <laughs> in verse 7, they were examples of the faith. Now, that's what we should strive for. We should strive to be he says in another place, worthy of our calling. Now, we're not, but we should act like it. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. There's nothing that we can claim makes us worthy in and of ourselves for heaven or righteousness or grace or anything that God's given us or to have eternal security. There's nothing that makes us worth it. He's promised, promised it to us, and that's a gift. But we should walk worthy of of the gift we've been given. And that's something we're always working on, or should be. In verse 8, they sounded out the word. That is, their life was an example, but it was a verbal example. You'll hear this thing, lifestyle evangelism. And that, I mean, you do need that. Your life should be an example. However, don't stop there. Because your life is never going to be enough of an example. It's going to require your mouth. And sometimes the best message you need to give is this one. Hey, I'm a hypocrite just like everybody else. I know right and sometimes I don't do it just like you. <laughs> okay, so that contradicts the lifestyle part, but it still gets the message out. And the message is important. There should be a sound to it. Uh, there's no such thing as a silent Christian. You know, God doesn't have a secret service, you know, in his army. It doesn't work that way. We're to be bold. Um, and th there's, a, there's a fine line between being bold and being proud. But don't cross that line. 
you'll find some that are just proud. They've got a lot of zeal and um, it's in head knowledge. Being bold is not in what you know, but being bold in who you know. And that's a difference. In chapter 5, the believers uh, there as, an, as a whole assembly are examples of leadership. The congregation is exemplary in verse 12 to 13. They had a high esteem for their God-given authority. That is, they esteemed their leaders uh, with double honor. Now, that's good if you have a good leader. But that doesn't mean you blindly give esteem and honor to anybody. You shouldn't. If they're not following Christ, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. You see me veering off, don't do that. <laughs> okay, that's what the Catholics do. They follow the Pope because he says it. That's not what Christians are supposed to do. God give us, gives us leaders down here to help us, you know, okay, there, there's where the road is, and they said this, and I'll check it out. But always check it out by the Bible. Otherwise, you're just following a man. But there are good men that you can give honor to, but reserve the best honor for Christ, <laughs> not man. They, um, they comforted the feeble in verse 14. They warned the unruly in verse 14. <laughs> Sometimes that has to be done. Uh, those are those people that are full of zeal and not much experience or knowledge. This was a young church. And that happens. Somebody gets saved, and man, it's such a great, you know, however much knowledge of it. You know, it sometimes takes years and years before we realize what happened when we got saved. I mean, there's just so much in it. I'm still learning things. <laughs> and a person gets saved, and they realize how great it was. And they just, they get on fire and get all this zeal, but they don't have anything to say. <laughs> and sometimes they have to be taught. There's nothing wrong with that. So the, the unruly have to be given some rules <laughs> the bible says that doesn't match over here that we don't do that anymore you know some of that has to be done that's okay now you don't do that proudly that has to be done with charity and we'll get into that in a minute in verse four they were patient toward all men that's that's how you correct somebody is patiently that is not demand and what is commonplace is this. There's no such thing, it seems like, anymore as what used to be called church discipline. That is a term that is out. It just sounds negative. It's not really negative. Church discipline should be church training. They used to have a course on Sunday nights, just like they have a Sunday school in the morning. They used to have a similar thing in the Sunday evening service. Before the Sunday service, it was called training union. That is, they would train you on doctrines and things like that. Training. Well, that's what Christian life is all about, is training, learning. You can help me learn something, I'll help you learn something. Let's learn. That's what we're here for. But it should be done with patience. And that's easy to do when you realize how patient God's had to be with us. <laughs> Many times we've had the same problem over and over and knew it and did wrong anyway, and he was patient, forgave us, gave us space to repent, and so then we should have that same patience and understanding with other people. Easier said than done. Verse 15, <laughs> they didn't render evil for evil. Now, that's an odd thing to see amongst a church. Sometimes your church members will render evil to you, or you'll perceive it as such. So don't repay it with evil. They followed that which was good to all men. Okay, now we've stretched out beyond the church house to all men. That's even the lost. Um, now, one reason that God's people are looking for the second coming. Well, not the we're not looking for the second coming. We're looking for the rapture. This book is going to talk about both. But one of the reasons that we look forward to it is trouble <laughs> guess what we're going to face trouble and I think God put some of that stuff in our path on purpose to remind us 
there's better in the future. Don't be looking at this as home. Don't get too comfortable here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you should love some of some of both. Yes. Yep. You should love the fact that one day you're not going to be holding a bill anymore. That's going to an empty house somewhere. <laughs> Somebody else will be paying the mortgage and the car note and all that stuff. You won't have to worry about it. Now, that you can enjoy that. Now, you should still be responsible in the meantime. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you can look forward to it. And, you know, he talks about recompensing them uh, that did you evil. I think one of the biggest tricks God's going to pull on the wicked world is this. When a lot of Christians leave, there's going to be a lot of unpaid bills <laughs> that the banks are going to be stuck with. And that's just, they're going to get it back. But, now, that's not the, you, you should not be looking forward to his returning out of malice to the world. <laughs> but the, the fact is, one day they are going to get theirs. Now, uh, the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, how do you say that? <laughs> Met with much affliction, it says. In chapter 1, verse 6, they were a persecuted bunch. Back then, it wasn't so much like it is in America. America, now it's heading that way. And if we let Nancy Pelosi take over, it will be that way. <laughs> But in other parts of the world, if you claim to be a Christian, just saying that makes you the object of persecution. And that's what this church was. Once they came out and said, we believe in Jesus Christ, and they had public baptisms. They didn't have them in a church somewhere hidden away. It was public so that all the rest of them could look at them and laugh. And that's what it was. They'd make fun of them. Not like we do now, you know, we clap and, you know, hooray, hooray. No, that's not what the church had originally. You got publicly dunked, and you became a target. And so they had much affliction there in this church. In chapter 2, verse 2, they were shamefully treated. We don't know anything about that. You know, we think when somebody gives us a dirty look for bowing our head and praying at you know a restaurant somewhere that we've been shamefully treated no no but you should enjoy that <laughs> not that you enjoy it but you should accept that there should be some shame that the lost world will direct toward you for lining up with jesus christ um and you can go through that. You'll see all the, the phrases he uses over and over in this book about um, the world had persecuted, had done them evil because they chose a side. As Christians, you have to choose a side every day in some way or fashion. Now, you can count on it. God's not going to... Everybody has to choose a side. Everybody. Nobody has graduated from... You know, I'm, I'm perfect now, I don't have to do it. No, every single day, there's some choice you have to make to make him prominent and you the peon. <laughs> every day. The first half of chapter 5, we find uh, two examples here. The, there's a contrast between those who are watching for the Lord's return and those who are not. <laughs> and you'll find this with Christians, and it shouldn't be so. The watchers... In verse 2, know the Lord's coming as a thief in the night. Okay, they know that the Lord is coming, and for us, he's coming back for us. The rapture is going to be similar to a thief in the night, because we're leaving, and he's not appearing to the lost world. When he comes back, they won't see it. It'll be the twinkling of an eye, and we'll be gone. They won't see it. But if you're... <coughs> a Christian that's following Christ, that's looking for him, then to you, you'll be ready. And I think a lot of Christians are going to be caught off guard. <laughs> They'll be heading into some places they shouldn't have been heading into and get yanked out of there in a hurry. <laughs> uh, in verse 9, 
They're prepared to obtain final salvation. The fact of the matter is, our salvation will not be complete until we're in his presence. And that's something we get to keep working on. Now, I say get to keep working on. We get rewards for doing what we should be doing anyway. God is just, uh, he's a lot better than I would be. <laughs> We're supposed to live like the creature he's made us. And he says, if you'll do it, I'll give you a reward when we get home. <laughs> you, if you got some kids, eventually you're going to have to pull that one on them. And you say, hey, look, if y'all just act right for the next 20 minutes, when we get home, I'll give you that ice cream. <laughs> That's what God does with us. If we'll act like we're supposed to anyway, he's promised us rewards and crowns and all kinds of good stuff. Look at verse 6. He says they're watchful and sober. Now, I know the word here means serious, but it also means not drunk. <laughs> There's no excuse for a Christian playing around with alcohol. None at all. You can't find any good reason for it in the Bible. Um, and I'll just leave it there. We could go, I'll go off on a tirade about alcohol if I don't. <laughs> verse 8 and verse 11. They have faith, hope, love, uh, and comfort. Now, you're going to have to share those things. You have faith, good. Is not just for you. Pass it out. Share it. Help somebody else have more faith. He says to everybody is given a measure of faith. That is, some people have more faith than the other. That doesn't mean one's better than the other. That means one is supposed to help the other. That's your job. If you've got more faith, good. Use it. Not on yourself to help somebody else. And the same with everything in the list, love, uh, comfort, so forth, so on. In verse 5, he calls them children of the day and not of the night. That is, this world is darkness. Jesus Christ is perfect light, 100% light. In him is no darkness or no variableness of darkness at all. Therefore, weigh things, judge them. Okay, if I bring this activity, this thought, this whatever it is, to Jesus Christ who is perfect light, will it match the environment he's in and wants to see, or will it appear to be outer dark, darkness that he's going to cast into outer darkness? Everything's either one of two, lightness or darkness. Um, okay, now he gives a great little analogy in here. One thing you find is that no Christian is supposed to be a Christian to themselves. We're all to be ministers. That blows people's mind. Everybody's supposed to be a preacher. Yes, women too. I know they naturally do it that way anyway, but... <laughs> yes, everybody is supposed to minister to someone in some form or fashion. And he talks about how to be a good minister. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Now there's the key. You cannot minister to men as man the focus. I was just talking to my dad about this. Um, you can't view the man as your convert, and you've got to convert man. Or else you'll be, you'll be patting yourself on the back when you won the argument. Or you'll be all down in the dumps when they don't uh, succumb to your argument. No, you do this for God because God has requested it. You minister for God, not for man. Um, and we should, of course, thank him for the privilege of doing it. You don't minister because you are so important and, and worthy of it. Nobody is. Amen. So start out. If you're going to minister to somebody, and God, God will show you who it is, when it is. When he does that, thank him for the opportunity and recognize you're not deserving of it. Okay, that starts things in the right direction, according to verse 4. He puts some do nots in there. 
things you should not do. <laughs> Don't do it to please men. Okay? And that's an easy trap to get in. If you are hanging out with the right crowd, they get pleased when they see other Christians doing the right thing. That's good. However, the flesh wants to jump in there and say, hey, they like that. Let me show them some more of it. <laughs> it's not about other people seeing it. Okay, so don't do it to please men. Don't use flattery. That's, that's written to Americans, I think. <laughs> Southerners especially. Up north, they don't care about flattery. <laughs> they, they'd rather cuss you out than give you a compliment. <laughs> and don't be covetous in verse 5. Don't do it for self-glory. And then there's some things you should do in verse 7. Do it with gentleness. The Bible's got some hard things to say, but you should be gentle. Let the Bible be the hard one. You know, God says, this is not me saying it. He's saying it to me as well as he says it to you. You know, the soul that sent us shall surely die. Let the Bible be the hard one. You don't have to come across as though you're God. We're not. Let God be God. Uh, we should do it with charity in verse 8. And we should be an example to not only the lost world, but other believers that will see us. Um, and he talks about the will of God in chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. Now he says it with the definite article, the will of God, as though there's only one. Well, there is. There's only one will of God, but it encompasses many, many things. <laughs> and here's a little portion of the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's just item number one. He's going to go through and give you many things you should abstain from. But it's a commandment of Jesus Christ that we do the will of God. That's our job. If you want to test yourself sometime, when you're just sitting there out of the clear blue, ask yourself, what's the will of God right now for me? Right this minute. If he comes down here and asks me, maybe he'll bring it to your mind sometime, and it will be him asking you, what's the will of God for me right this minute? What am I, what's his will for me in the next 10 minutes? You see, that makes it a lot more convicting than what's the will of God for your life. Okay, that's some big, great, big, and that may or may not be so. <laughs> but in the next 10 minutes, you can count on it. He's got a will for you, and you're going to be accountable to it. So that, that's a tough thing to do. It's in verse 3, it's sanctification. That is getting this flesh and soul clean. Everything we do should be clean. First thing on the list in verse 3 is abstaining from fornication. That's physical. Now, it can be spiritual too. If you don't have a problem with the physical, then move on to the spiritual. <laughs> I, you can always tell the people that have a problem with that one. I was teaching that one night. And somebody raised their hand and says, that means spiritual, doesn't it? It's not talking about physical. Wait a minute, somebody got a problem. No, it means it physical. <laughs> if you've got a problem with the physical, take it like you see it. If you don't have a problem with the physical, don't stop there. See if you can make an application. Do you have any problem with it spiritually? Okay, so good. Let's take care of that problem. Then he says um, in verse 4 to 5, we're to take possession of the flesh. That is, you control this flesh. Mm. That's making this body serve Christ, not you. And we should be holy, in verse 7. And we should love the family, in verse 9. That is, the more you start doing right, the more you love seeing other people that are doing the same. You have a greater appreciation for it. There's a reason that a lot of Christians don't like seeing Christians who are acting like Christians, because they're not. <laughs> Therefore, they don't appreciate the work that it takes to tell the flesh to shut up. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. And when you see somebody do it, it's an encouragement to you, and that should build a bond. Christians should have a strong bond, because we all should be suffering the same thing this wicked world. And when you come to church, the building where they, what they call an auditorium now, they used to call a sanctuary. I love that term. 
It's a sanctuary. That's your safe haven. And Christians should feel comfortable when they get together in a church because they're all striving to please God and encourage each other. Now, our duty is, is also listed here in chapter 5, verse 16. Our duty is to rejoice evermore. Not to make it hard or anything, but... <laughs> He didn't say Joyce, he said rejoice. <laughs> so when you think you've done it once, you just start it. You've got to keep doing it. <laughs> rejoice. He says to pray without ceasing. And sometimes we don't do that one, so he gives us a reason to. <laughs> so we can remember, oh yeah, we're supposed to be praying. And there ain't no way anybody could help me out of this. God help. And then you're back into praying. <laughs> and we're to give thanks in everything. Those are some tough things. Now, he's not condemning this church. He's given them encouragement. He's encouraged by this. He's gotten a great report from Timothy about how great this church is. And he's encouraged. And it just so happens that he gives more instruction. They're not viewing it as he's bad-mouthing them. And that's not his intent. But he's encouraging them because they've already seen the need to head in this direction. And if you're heading the right way, when you hear instruction from God, it doesn't seem like a discouragement for you. It's an encouragement. Because he's telling me how to hit the ball, you know, when it's a curved ball. Okay, that would be nice to know, wouldn't it? Yeah. Then our diligence is, uh, of course, to anticipate his coming. We should diligently, every day, be looking forward to that. Because that gives us hope. The Christian has a hope. The lost world doesn't have. And that is one day we'll be with him. And if we keep that in mind, it helps your face. <laughs> I see a lot of good Christians. And, uh, I mean, they got a lot of good doctrine and Bible and great stuff on the ball. But their face doesn't know it yet. <laughs> they walk around grumpy and upset all the time. And, you know, always looking at how wicked this world is. And we got something that's so far out of this world. Why would that discourage you? <laughs> so if you keep the, the second coming in mind, it'll help with that. And let's see, I've got more here. Uh, I'm just going to cover one other thing and we'll be done. Chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter 5, verse 9. Somebody already mentioned this, but this is a good one. Chapter 5, verse 9. You'll need to know this because some people, and it's becoming more and more popular right now, People saying that we, as Christians, will go through the tribulation. Here's why we can. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, to, not that you don't have salvation now. You're saved eternally. But you're not 100% saved yet. This body isn't. This flesh isn't. One day it will be. One day the transaction will be complete. And that will be the salvation he's talking about. Completed. Now, we're not appointed. That is, it's not on our calendar. We don't have an appointment for that. For wrath. And there's a special wrath he's talking about. It's in Revelation 15. Revelation 15, verse 7. Revelation 15, 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. The tribulation is obviously the wrath of God. Now, we can see his displeasure on this earth. We see some hurricanes and some forest fires in California. <laughs> you see some things you know is God saying, I'm not happy about this. And you can see it. But that's not the wrath of God. That's just a little, I'm upset. But when he pours out his full wrath, that's something we won't be around for. Chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 1, uh, Revelation 16, 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying, unto the, uh, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the vials of wrath of God. Uh, of the wrath of God upon the earth. One day he's going to pour out all of his wrath. Right now he's reserving his wrath. You'll find that. I covered that one Sunday in the Old Testament there. What he does is he gets mad 
And the way he keeps us cool is he's got a reservoir. He reserves it. It's these vials. He puts his wrath back in the reservoir of vial and just uses a little bit of his wrath. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. The only thing that can wear him out is holding him back. I reckon that's why he's got it in the bottles in the first Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's the it's the the radiator. It's your radiator that has a reservoir on it, and if you need water, it pulls it over so you can keep the engine cool. If it gets too hot, it distributes that liquid back into the reservoir. The way God keeps his cool is he reserves wrath. He has a reservoir for it. It's called a vial in Revelation. He says, I've been doing it so long, I got seven vials of them. <laughs> and I'm going to pour them out. Wrath against the day of wrath. That's right. Good. All right, that'll do it for tonight.